Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. This is a continuation of my Quest for Power series. So, if you haven't seen the episodes on cylinders, don't miss out. Go back and get them. Superchargers and turbochargers are terms that come up when we are discussing Warbirds. So, beyond having really powerful kick-ass names, what are these things? As an engine is transported to higher altitudes, the air gets thin, and just like a living thing, our engine starts having trouble breathing. By the time you reach 18,000 feet, about half of the atmosphere is below you, meaning that there just isn't much air for our living engine to breathe. It's not able to fulfill its life's work of producing power very well anymore. What to do? It was a problem that had been worked on for different applications as early as 1860 when the Roots brothers, who founded the Roots Blower Company of Cornersville, Indiana, patented a design for a blower for use in blast furnaces. It took some time, but by 1885, Gottlieb Daimler received a patent in Germany for supercharging an internal combustion engine, which basically used a blower to force more air into an engine. There are several types of blowers, such as the Roots Compressor, the Lisholm, Twin Screw, Sliding Vane, Scroll Type, or Centrifugal Supercharger. And after a new technology gets added, soon after come the refinements. You could imagine that a blower geared to the engine could end up providing too much pressure at sea level and not enough when way high up. The solution was having multiple speeds and then multiple stage superchargers. Think of it like switching gears in a car. At about 12,000 feet when the throttle was wide open, the pressure in the intake manifold would start to drop off with the supercharger in the low speed setting. The pilot would then pull back the throttle and switch to the higher gear, which would spin the supercharger faster and blow in more air. Then the pilot would readjust the throttle to the desired manifold pressure. Later on, with newer technology, switching these settings became automated. To get even more boost at higher altitudes, you could add a second stage to the supercharger, which would compress the air again once it came out of the first stage. Initially, pilot controls were needed to control dampers that would either cut in or cut out the second stage before things again became automated. Does anyone see a problem with compressing all this air and twice? Compressed air gets hot. If you blow all that high pressure, high temperature air into the engine, you can cause the fuel air mixture to explode on its own and not when the spark plug fires. This is called detonation and the overly hot gas can cause it as well as heat damage to the engine block or pistons. To cool down the compressed air, they added an intercooler between the stages, which is like a radiator to draw away the heat from the compressed air. Another way to cool down the system during high power settings, such as takeoff or dogfights, was to install a water injection system. This squirted water into the cylinders, which helped cool things down. A future video will address this even more. But what actually turns all the parts of the supercharger stages? It needs to be powered by the engine itself, the energy being provided by belts, gears, or chain drives. And there's the rub. Even though the supercharger adds engine power, it also steals some engine power to do it. If only there was a way to get the energy to power the blower for free. But that's just a fantasy, right? There's no way to get free energy. Alfred Bucci thought he knew of a way. He was born on July 11, 1879 and attended engineering school in Zurich and worked as an engineer in both Belgium and the UK. Early on in his career, he became obsessed with the idea of improving the efficiency of engines using the wasted heat in the exhaust. In 1905, he patented something he described as a, in quotes, solution to capture such heat using an axial compressor, radio piston engine, and axial turbine on a common shaft, close quotes. And in just a few succinct words, my friends, that is the description of a turbocharger. A power turbine is placed in the exhaust stream that spins with the residual power in the gases escaping from the cylinders. This turbine is shafted to a compressor that shoves even more air into the engine at the other end. 
The beauty of the turbocharger is that the power to operate the compressor is essentially free as it is taken from the energy in the exhaust that is being dumped overboard anyway. In fact, the early name for a turbocharger was a turbo supercharger, which means that it was a supercharger powered by a turbine instead of being driven from the engine. But Bucci wasn't able to start making them right away as the technology and materials just weren't ready yet. In fact, it would take another 10 years for a prototype even to be built, and it wasn't all that reliable. You have to understand that the gases coming out of an engine are crazy hot, requiring special metal alloys and techniques to prevent them from melting or bursting into flames. In the end, Bucci ended up specializing in turbochargers for maritime diesel engines. In 1925, he successfully incorporated a turbocharger on a 10-cylinder diesel engine which boosted the power output from 1,750 to 2,500 horsepower. This engine was used on a couple of German passenger ships. Meanwhile, back in the States, Sanford Alexander Moss was a 45-year-old engineer working for General Electric in their steam turbine division in Lynn, Massachusetts. In 1917, his boss tasked him with coming up with a new type of turbine which could pre-compress the air before going to an aircraft engine carburetor. Moss went to work, and the next year, in 1918, he was testing his turbo supercharger at Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio. In order to test it at altitude, but without actually flying, he installed it on a V-12 Liberty aircraft engine and drove it up to Pikes Peak, Colorado the summit of which is 14,000 feet, and it was a success, producing far more power than an engine without turbocharging, which is known as normally aspirated if you want to be technical. A couple of years later in 1921, Moss and his team installed his device on a leftover World War I LUSAC biplane. The LUSAC, which stands for Le Père United States Army Combat was a biplane designed in France but built under contract in the U.S. for the war. It was usually powered by a normally aspirated Liberty engine, which could power it up to a ceiling of 20,000 feet. However, with Moss's new turbocharger, it was able to climb up to an amazing and record-breaking altitude of 40,000 feet. Moss retired from GE in 1938, and in 1940 he was presented with the Collier Trophy which is awarded to those who have made the greatest achievement in aeronautics or astronautics in America with respect to improving the performance, efficiency, and safety of air or space vehicles. People like Glenn H. Curtis, Orville Wright, Howard Hughes, Donald W. Douglas, and the entire crew of Apollo 11 have won the Collier, so it's pretty good company. So now we know that a supercharger is powered by the engine and turbocharger is powered by the exhaust. Knowing this, one might ask why any engine manufacturer would install a supercharger instead of a turbocharger. For example, the famous Merlin engine, which powered the Avril Lancaster, de Havilland Mosquito, Hawker Hurricane, P-51 Mustang, and Supermarine Spitfire did not have a turbocharger. It did, however, have a multi-stage supercharger. Because although the turbocharger was more efficient, it required a heck of a lot more ducts and piping to collect and control the exhaust, route it to the turbo, and then duct the intake air back to the engine. All of this stuff needed space, and of course it was heavy. Everything in aviation is a compromise. Turbochargers were installed on P-38 Lightnings. You could see them on the top of the wing, back where the boom starts. They initially had a lot of problems with the engines in Europe, however had better success in the Pacific after all the teething problems were sorted out. B-17s, B-24s, and B-29s all had turbo superchargers. Fun fact, the B-29's cabin was pressurized by compressed air supplied by the turbos of the inboard engines. Instead of heading for the carburetors, some of the compressed air was directed through an aftercooler and into the cabin through the cabin air valve. Handy things, those turbos. The P-47 and Vought F4U Corsair are a nice comparison as both use the Pratt & Whitney R2800 double wasp engine, but the P-47 used a turbocharger and the Corsair did not. The turbocharger system installation on the P-47 is pretty crazy. 
The turbo is actually in the tail with the exhaust piping going all the way back there and the induction air being ducted all the way forward again. It's partly what makes the jug such a chunky plane. However, what all that ducting and piping did was to provide more power at high altitudes. Even though the P-47 looked less sleek and less aerodynamic and weighed about a thousand pounds more, it was at least 13 miles per hour faster than the Corsair, and this fastest speed was up at 30,000 feet, while the Corsair was fastest at 19,000. Lastly, you may hear the term turbo compounding, which really came in after the war. In this case, the exhaust gases run through a series of power recovery turbines, which not only drive a compressor, but are also geared back to the propellers to add a few hundred horsepower back to the system. Again, there will be another video to look more closely at this. Next up, we'll be looking at fuels, which, although they might be overlooked, they could actually be a war-winning technology. Until next time.